All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Kelvin Moxley from Knoxville, Tennessee, and also uh, by way of Lebanon, Tennessee, and I want to uh, say hello to my uh, former representative, uh, Chairman Bone. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Chairman Bone and Vice Chairman Bar Borsha for uh, allowing me to speak today uh, on this issue. Um, I'll, I'll try to make this as quick and, and as brief as possible and just start out by saying that liberty is a precious and fragile commodity that is hard won and easily destroyed. It is not destroyed, however, by the sledgehammer, but it's chipped away little by little over, over time by, with a chisel. It's chipped away by government that neither respects nor recognizes liberty. And so to protect individual liberty and maintain a robust free market, the founders of our state and our nation designed a government that was supposed to be restrained in doing the things that it uh, that do, was restrained to doing just those things that either the free market can't do or can't do as well. A smoking ban is one of those issues that really separates people who believe in smaller government enforcing their own biases from those who truly believe in smaller government and private property rights. A ban on smoking and business by government fiat is rejection of the concept of limited government. It embraces the concept that public policy is based on whether market power, based on whether the naked power of government wants to, uh, that government wants to exercise. It embraces the concept that uh, that anything that government wants to do in the name of the public good is okay, and you can exercise that naked power to achieve that goal. And on that path lies the gallows and the gulag. We don't always like the results of freedom, but the alternative of oppression, even well-meaning oppression, is equally unacceptable. The marketplace can and does achieve the goal of banning smoking. There's no doubt about that. It does it every hour of every day. The marketplace has demonstrated amply on, on countless occasions in this area, its ability to, to address the desires of the non-smoking public. It does this each and every day in every business, every restaurant. You can add to the list of non-smoking venues. In just two minutes on the Internet, and I can provide you with this list, I compiled a list of about nearly 500 restaurants across the Tennessee that are non-smoking. That's just 500 that I got together within two minutes of going on the Internet. I know there, there's, and, uh, the actual number is ten times that. It wasn't that long ago that a totally non-smoking restaurant and workplace was a rarity. Now they are the exception that has become the rule. More importantly, it was done without government intervention. Nobody mandated, no government, no legislator, no law mandated that there be completely non-smoking restaurants, but they are there. Where once smokers and non-smokers co-mingled in the same place, they're now segregated. Where once the sides of smoking and non-smoking areas were on equal footing, now smoking sections are significantly smaller and relegated to the least desirable portions of the restaurant, and even those areas are on borrowed time. The number of completely non-smoking restaurants and workplaces grows each minute without the heavy hand of government. Indeed, a state law is a solution in search of a problem. A statutory ban on, on smoking tramples the right of private business and private business owners decide how he or she wishes to cater to his potential customers. It is now a point, in fact, it is now a point of competitive advantage for a restaurant to say that it is non-smoking, to say that it is smoke-free. And if an individual is offended by tobacco smoke, he has a multitude of alternative loca locales available to him. If a business owner sees that his clientele is dropping off because he allows smoking, he can make his business smoke-free and get those clients back. Going smoke-free, it pays off for the restaurant, which once again raises the question, why do we need a one-size-fits-all rule when once again the marketplace is already achieving the goal that you are wanting to achieve? Customers are fully capable of sending those signals to the entrepreneur that they want a non-smoking restaurant, and entrepreneurs are perfectly capable of deciding to listen to those signals, take them into account, changing policies as they see fit. If you wish to create some sort of new social norm that discourages people from smoking, it's already there. You don't need another law to do it. But in a state and country that champions, indiv champions the individual, freedom of choice, and personal responsibility, 
A statutory smoking ban is ample evidence that politicians just don't trust the citizens and business owners enough to make those decisions and make the right choice. If government wants to ban smoking, it can. It can ban smoking in those areas over which it has direct control or, over, or ownership. Government is well within, its, well within its power and its authority to ban smoking in government buildings and on government property. And it does that. But to ban smoking on private property is an assault upon private property rights. And while some of you may think this is a small positive step in stamping out smoking, as a smoker I have to ask, what is the next step? More and more public officials are, are, are starting to warm up to the idea that the full force of the state should be brought down on people making unhealthy choices. California, so often the first state to reach new frontiers in silly public policy, was an early adopter of smoking bans. And it also shows the direction the pro-ban forces may take us. After driving smokers out of bars and out of restaurants, the anti-smoking act activists have sought, and with some a bit of uh, with, uh, considerable success, to drive them off the beaches, off the sidewalks, and, and out of other out outdoor public spaces. Another example, at, at a town hall meeting held in Washington, D.C., somebody raised the question of what do we do when after we've driven all the smokers out of the workplace and they're gathered and congregating out on the sidewalks up and down the uh, streets of downtown Washington and complaints skyrocket from all the noise? Well, the answer, well, we'll just we'll crack down on anti-loitering laws. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the slope onto which you're taking your first small step. And while getting people to stop smoking is a desirable government goal, is a desirable goal. Government has no right to promote it by restricting the freedom of business owners to set the rules for the premises that they own. And they have no right to push adults out into the cold, outside the protection of the law, for the sin of indulging in a perfectly legal product. And you may think that smoking is a nasty, nasty habit. And secondhand, secondhand smoke is it's extraordinarily unpleasant. But what's truly obnoxious is to drive to make us all healthier people through the coercive arm of the law. And that's the impulse behind the smoking ban, and it has no place, no place, in a free and tolerant and diverse state. Please, let's just say no to the nanny state. I have one more thing to say uh, in closing. It's a poem from a German pastor about another effort to deal with undesirable elements of society. First they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the sick, the so-called incurables, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't mentally ill. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Next they came for the Catholics and I didn't speak out because I was not a Catholic. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me. There will surely come a day when something legal you enjoy becomes the target of the nanny state. And who will be there to speak for you? Thank you, Mr. Moxley. Do we have any questions? <coughs> Representative Bell. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. I, I enjoyed that and, and I probably share your political philosophy. I struggle with this question, especially regulating and banning a legal product. How would you view, though, a total ban? Because, because there, we do ban things as a state and as a government that are harmful to you. Now, because you even made the statement several times in your argument, you know, this is a legal product. What about a total ban? What if we just said smoking is going to be illegal in the state of Tennessee? How would that... If you wish to ban it, you are well within your, your power to do so. You're well, well within, one might even stretch that to say, your authority to do so. 
Whether or not it's right or wrong, that is a question that has to be decided by the public, and you will stand and face the consequences of the ban. However, I will go forward for, uh, further and say that if you were to ban it, I certainly hope you would be, have the, uh, the integrity to stand up and forego the revenue that comes from it. Thank you. Any other questions from Mr. Moxley? Thank you. How long have you been off East Richmond Shop Road? About uh, five years now, living in Knoxville, doing a radio show. Made a mistake. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin.